Well, welcome back. We have another full day planned for you, as you can see from your schedule. A lot of um, interesting talks today as well. And we're going to begin with a keynote from Terry Sanofsky. Uh, I'll introduce him in a moment. But I just wanted to, to begin by saying, uh, people often ask me, uh, what does ANFA actually do? And, and it's, a, it's a fair question. And our mission is to explicitly to promote exchange of knowledge between the, the communities of architecture and neuroscience. And in understanding that, it's important to point out a couple of things that we don't do. Um, and one of those things is uh, we don't do research. We are not a research organization. What we try to do is find connections, and in particular through the Hay Grant program, uh, we fund pilot projects that are the research projects at the intersection of, of neuroscience and architecture. Another thing that we're not is a consulting service. Um, I sometimes have architects who come to me and, and ask, well, uh, given your knowledge of the relationship between neuroscience and architecture, what can you tell us about how to build this building? And, and at this point, you know, I can speculate personally about those kinds of things, and I often do. I, I, I can't help it. but. <laughs> but this is not what, um, what ANFA is really about, at least not at this point. I can envision a day in which that may happen, that there may be um, an, an arm of this organization that's involved in providing consulting services for, for architects based on neuroscience knowledge. So there's a couple of things that we're not, but the thing that we explicitly are is an organization designed to promote this, this, uh, this connection. And we do that through a variety of means. This conference is one of those means. Um, I'm extremely pleased at how this one is going. Uh, we did this two years ago, and it went very well. And I see this whole, there's this energy, and the whole thing is expanding in a, in a, very, um, a very good way, I believe. And we have a num number of other uh, sort of operations of that sort. We have an inter uh, a, um, uh, regular public lecture series is called Interfaces, and we do lectures. The typical kind of thing is we, we pair somebody from the field of architecture with somebody from the field of neuroscience, and the, the important point is to have some sort of substantive connection between those two in a way that appeals to, the, to a popular audience. So we'll be making announcements um, very soon about additional lectures of that sort in the coming year. Uh, another avenue we have for promoting this exchange of knowledge is it, it, people, architects commonly, come to us and say, is there a literature on this particular subject? And in many cases there is, and it's, it's hard to find, particularly if you're, if you're an academic and you have access to the libraries. Um, uh, there's a huge library at UCSD, and those of us in academia can search that library, find articles in lots of journals, but in, for people who are practicing architects, it's sometimes hard to do. So what we've tried to do is go through that literature and, uh, and create a database, a uh, searchable database where you can you know, have a particular issue. How do, how do I design a school, for example? And you can search that database and find articles that are relevant to that subject research studies coming from fields of cognitive science, neuroscience, experimental psychology, and so forth. Uh, we are in the process of developing this. Uh, the data exists, that is, the, the papers exist, but we're trying to put it together in a form that is easily accessible and searchable. And this is now connected with the, uh, there's something called the BRIC database. I actually, to be honest, I can't remember what BRIC is an acronym for, B-R-I-K, uh, but it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's promoted by the the National uh, Institute of Building, NIBS, National Institute of Building Science. Thank you, Fred. Uh, and so we are connected with them. They, they have a database that's, that's f f uh, fed by lots of different sources, and we are one of those sources. So I encourage, and this exists right now, so I encourage you to go and take a look at that if you're interested, and, and it will grow over time. So those are some of the ways in which we're, we're trying to make this connection. Uh, another issue I, I think that's important to consider is, at the moment, our, the connection we're making is between architecture and neuroscience, but there are many problems, many cognitive problems that are analogous to the problem of how you, how you navigate through and interact with uh, a built environment. 
And, um, for example, uh, the ways in which people play games, for example, it's a similar kind of thing, where you're, there's a cognitive process that's involved and you interact with the, the system in a certain way. And I, I think in the future, we will probably start to expand and incorporate information from those other analogous kinds of cognitive operations. And this could, um, I think, give, they, they don't have the same impact as architecture does. Architecture, for all the obvious reasons, has a huge impact on our society and culture. But there may be principles of cognitive operations that we can understand by considering some of these other possibilities. So I, I just wanted to give you sort of a brief uh, idea of who we are and where we're headed. Um, we, we are an organization that very much depends upon input from the people who are actually in, at that interface and I encourage all of you to be active participants to, um, to give us ideas or suggestions about where we should be going and, and what's important. And uh, we, we exist at the moment as a board, uh, board of directors, and that's been the, the form in which the organization has existed for a decade now. We've expanded out to this advisory council, but uh, we, we really view ourselves as a, a larger organization that serves the interests of the fields of architecture and neuroscience. So please stay in touch. Uh, now what I want to do is introduce our keynote speaker for the, for the morning, uh, my good friend and colleague, Terry Sanofsky. Terry and I, um, Terry was a graduate student at Princeton and so was I. Uh, I arrived in Princeton about the time he was finishing. Terry was in the physics department and did his thesis working with a man named John Hopfield uh, and did some of the, the pioneering early work on neural networks and that which may come up in Terry's talk, talk today. Uh, and he is one of the leading computational and theoretical neuroscientists in the world today. And uh, I've been very fortunate for the past, it's been over 25 years, to have Terry's lab right next to mine here at the Salk Institute. Uh, we, have, we have prime real estate. We're in the South Building on the, the South Con Building on the third floor, the courtyard level and um, a, a nice suite of offices and laboratory space in, in that location. Um, when I arrived in Princeton, again, it's a long time ago, I arrived in Princeton, and Terry was um, a little bit of a mystery, and, but he was, he, was, um, he was legendary somehow when I got there. He was a physicist, and yet doing something that had to do with the brain. And a lot of people didn't quite understand this. And, and I got the, so people told me lots of stories about Terry, which I, I won't repeat. But, <laughs> but there is one comment that has stuck in my mind over the years, which is that Terry is the, the, the sort of person who wouldn't live in a house with square walls. And, and I, which I think was a euphemism for something much deeper. But it, it actually is an interesting comment on the relationship between mental activity and, and architecture, um, which, which I've, I've yet to truly figure out. But in any case, he's, uh, Terry's, as I said, he's one of the leaders in the field of computational neuroscience. Uh, he's um, been on our faculty here for, well, since the late 1980s. Uh, he arrived shortly after I did here at the Salk Institute. And he, uh, he's, uh, he, he's has many awards. Terry has a dis distinction of being one of, I think, 10 people who are members of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy's Institute of Medicine, uh, which is just a reflection of the fact that he is, uh, his work is extremely important to society today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Terry, who's going to talk about uh, learning how to learn. Well, uh, thank you, Tom, for that introduction, which brings back lots of memories of, of you, too, <laughs> uh, in Charlie Gross's lab um, at Princeton. Uh, John Eberhardt's talk last night also brought back memories and reminded me that actually I was at the initial meeting where he met with some of our faculty, um, uh, Rusty Gage and, and Tom, and just before the uh, big uh, meeting that was going to be held here, and uh, and, and and broached this concept, would uh, th you know, th would we help? And 
little did I know what it would grow into uh, today. It was uh, really, it's been really impressive to see how uh, it has taken root and has th flourished. In fact, I was at the very first ANFA meeting, which was held at Woods Hole, the National Academy's conference center. And the theme was hospitals. And it was eye-opening because uh, I, I w left that meeting thinking that if I want to design a, a, a building that was optimally unhealthy, I would end up with modern hospitals. I mean, I'm serious. This is, it was, it's really that bad. Uh, I won't go into the details, except uh, you know, we could do a lot better. Well, today's uh, talk is uh, going, to be, going to be about learning. And if you think about what our species is really good at, we are not the strongest animal out there. We are not the fastest. We are not, we, you know, we can't fly. And if you ask, what are we really, really good at? Most people would say, well, language. But that's not really our, our special talent. Our special talent is learning. We could learn faster and more than any other species. And that's what has created culture. That's what has created uh, architecture, is the fact that we are able to uh, educate are young and to learn new things, creativity. This is all part of the, uh, our brain, our, our heritage. This is how uh, we're, uh, neuros as neuroscientists, we're trying to understand, we're trying to get to the basic mechanisms underlying all of these abilities that we have. So this particular story I'm gonna tell you um, to this morning, hit the witch. Click the mouse. Oh, okay. There you go. This story actually begins across the street. So this is uh, another famous building at, on the UC campus called the, the Geisel Library. Theodore Geisel, who is better known as uh, Dr. Seuss, uh, lived in La Jolla. And his widow is still uh, here, uh, living in La Jolla. And uh, this library was named after him. Uh, it, uh, I'm the director of uh, Institute for Neural Computation. I'm the only faculty at the Salk that uh, is also a faculty at UCSD. Uh, we have about 20 faculty. And uh, about eight years ago, we received a big grant from the National Science Foundation, which created uh, a Science of Learning Center. There are six of them in the United States. Uh, ours is focusing on temporal dynamics how uh, the brain activity changes over time on many different time scales. We have about 50 faculty in 10 institutions. Uh, it's, it's been extraordinarily uh, interactive. And uh, one of the things that came out of it was um, thinking about how is it that, uh, it, it, as we learn more about the brain, how can we help educational practice? You know, the sort of classrooms that we have, I was you know, telling you the story about learning about hospitals. Well, you know, we came to the conclusion if you want to, so the optimal, optimally bad environment for teaching is you take all the kids at the same age and you put them together in a classroom and then you have this lockstep. It's like an assembly line, right? That's, that's really not the best environment for learning. The best environment for learning is, is basically interacting with people of all ages, people who are uh, working and actually doing things. You know, you learn by doing. You don't just sit there and passively absorb information. You have to be actively engaged. And that's what your brain really learns when you're actively uh, seeking the information, not just passively absorbing it. So in um, 2009, uh, together with colleagues at, uh, in, in the uh, Temporal Dynamics of Learning Center and also uh, Pat Cole and Andy Meltzoff, we put together a a, a kind of an overview piece, which was published in Science Magazine, which uh, pointed out that in addition to uh, the traditional uh, sources of, uh, of, of uh, information from the educational community, and also from psychology, cognitive psychologists have been really working on these problems for many, many years, but there's a, two new sources of information that were coming online very rapidly that we could take advantage of 
first of all, neuroscience. We were getting new techniques uh, were becoming available, brain imaging, you saw that last night. But there was another one which turned out to be critically important for our center, and that turns out to be machine learning. So, I, I've, <clears throat> so I've already told you that uh, that's something we're really, really good at. Uh, it turns out computers are really, really bad at learning. Why? Well, the reason is that they're designed to do very, very careful arithmetic and logic, uh, but what they're not good at is pattern recognition. Now, uh, the early days of AI, when I was uh, at Princeton, uh, if, if you wanted to do artificial intelligence, you go to a place like the AI lab at MIT, and you would learn how to program rule-based symbol processing approaches to trying to solve complex problems. That approach, we now know, was, uh, uh, was a dead end. And the reason was that people vastly underestimated the difficulty of the problems that the brain has to solve. They thought that we could write a program that could solve chess problems, that could prove theorems. And therefore, you know, it's only around the corner that we can actually program it to do things that you know, aren't, aren't, aren't replaces humans in intelligence. Well, that turned out to be much more difficult than they thought. And the reason is they underestimated the complexity of vision. The fact that you could just look out and see things is, is, is effortless. But for, uh, you know, they still have not written the vision program, right? Computers can't see nearly as well as you can. M uh, motor activity, right? We have incredibly fluid motor uh, programs that allow us to interact with the world. These robots are really clunky, right? And the reason is that they're just, uh, we don't, we, we vastly underestimated how much computation it takes to do that. So these are the things, that, the difficult problems. And uh, it was about that time that, uh, as Tom mentioned, I got interested in uh, the early days of neural networks back in the 80s. And uh, I want to uh, actually go back, take the time machine back, and, and uh, play for you one of the demonstrations that we developed in those early 80s. Uh, and the idea was to try to explain and, and try to explore this concept of learning in the context of a very oversimplified model of the human brain. So here, here's the model. We have uh, sensory inputs, and you can think of this as vision, somatosensory, auditory, and, and these neurons represent the information of, in the sensory world in the form of these action potentials, which then project into uh, higher brain centers, which then project to the motor output. And, and, and this reflex loop is something that uh, is very elaborated. Here I just have three layers, an input layer, uh, an output layer, and then these hidden units. We, this is something that Jeff Hinton and I actually uh, coined this word. The idea is it's hidden from the outside. You, you don't see them. You only see uh, things that are coming out from the muscles and what's going into the, uh, into the eye. And, and here's, here's the problem. The problem with learning is figuring out how to s uh, assign strengths to each of these connections. And there, in this particular case, in the case of the brain, there are 10 to the 14. It's an immense number of connections and synapses that connect the neurons that is so overwhelming is it was we you know you throw your hands up when you try to understand it, how uh, how to deal with it and back in those days uh, with our primitive computers uh, we were able to handle networks that had you know maybe 300 of these model neurons and maybe you know a, a, a few thousand connection strengths but the idea was to come up with a way to set the weights so that you can solve a problem. And so here's a, a problem that um, a graduate student from Princeton who uh, did a summer project in my lab, Charlie Rosenberg, worked on. It was called NetTalk. So here's the problem. The problem is if you look at English orthography for words, it's extremely ambiguous how you pronounce a given letter. For example, the C in cat is pronounced k. But if it was a C in city, it would be s. And it turns out English is amongst the most complex in terms of uh, the number of possible sounds each letter can have and the rules that are used to determine what it is. And in fact, uh, one of the things you learn when you're getting to read is how to do that mapping from letters to sounds. So here's what we set up. We set up a little network that had a bunch of units to represent letters. We had a window of seven letters, and we moved it through the text one at a time. And, and the goal of the network was to come up 
with, uh, by activating neurons in the hidden unit layer, and then by the hidden units activating units in the output layer, to come up with a, a representation of what the correct phoneme is. There are 44 in English, and so you had to assign one of the 44 to each letter. Now, at the very beginning, of course, the, these weights were set randomly, and, and there's, there's no, uh, you know, there's absolutely no knowledge in the network. But uh, at, on every, at every trial, you come up with a guess, and then what you do is, if it's wrong, you uh, backpropagate the error and you change the strength so that you can come closer to the correct answer. And the idea is by going through enough examples, you eventually learn through experience. And that's really the central concept, learning through experience. And that's really what we do when we go to school. We're learning through experience. And this is opposed to, at the time, this AI establishment, which was based on rules. And so we went to the library, and it turns out there's a book 400 pages long with the rules of English uh, pronunciation. And, and it turns out that there's, for every rule, there's tons of exceptions. And for every exception, it turns out there are rules for the exceptions. And then there's rules within rules, and there's rules all the way down. So it, you know, the, the idea that you could have this little network with 300 units that was gonna be able to uh, correctly pronounce English was considered by the linguists at the time laughable. They did. They they just thought we were. Uh, if they, you know, if it took, if for them it was such a difficult problem, then uh, it, it would, it certainly this little network is, would be um, hopeless. So I'm going to play for you to a clip. At the very beginning of the learning, this is what it sounded like. In other words, what we're doing now is I'm taking the output and just playing it through each phoneme by phoneme so you can actually hear the network learning. So here's the first sounds coming out of the network. So it, it goes for a long time through this period of babbling where it just comes up with sounds and it, it figures out the difference between consonants and vowels, and so it goes ba, ba, ga, ga for quite a while, a long time. But then, and this is something that just took us by surprise, after a couple of hours, it had mastered a page of text. And I'm going to play this for you. Now, this is actually a transcription. Uh, uh, this is uh, from an actual kid just talking about things that were going on in his life, from the Carteret and Jones. And we just went through, it, it, it basically, uh, as you'll see, uh, was able to come up with a pretty good approximation to what the, what the kid was probably saying. Uh, by the way, we used as the teacher, of course, the transcription. This is a special book. Uh, on the left side was the text, and on the right side were the phonemes. And so we used the phonemes as the teacher for the, for the text. Mina, I'm lighting gun or something when we walk home from school. I walk home with two friends, and sometimes we can't run home from school now. Because so th this, this was a, a great surprise. And in fact, uh, I would come to the Salk occasionally to visit. Uh, I had friends at UCSD. And, uh, and I was invited by Francis Crick to come to the faculty lunch. And I actually played this tape at the faculty lunch. And I remember Inder Verma, in particular, was, uh, who's a, a colleague of mine, was very uh, taken by it. And, and, and it, 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 it sort of it, it speaks for itself. It it's basically tells you that this is a really powerful tool. And it turns out that these rules and exceptions are absorbed by the network. And the network just figures it out. It's a much better model. Even though it's very small and inadequate, underpowered, it's a much better model for the complexities of the world. That was, that was a discovery. Now, the problem, though, is that the computers we had back then were 1,000th the power of your smartphone. It was like a, a million operations per second. Your smartphone can do a, 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 a gigaflop, as it's called, right? So that's, that's a billion. Well, uh, that was uh, back in the 80s. Fast forward, OK, and I'll come back to this. So now, uh, here we are uh, in a new era in which education is rapidly changing. And one of the things that the internet has made possible is massively online open courses, or MOOCs. How many people here have taken a MOOC online? OK, so about half of you 
have uh, had the opportunity. They're free. And uh, last August, uh, Barbara Oakley and I uh, created a MOOC consisting of about 50 lectures and quizzes and tests and you know, a lot of material and f forums where the students can talk to each other and we could interact with them. It, it's, it's really quite an impressive uh, piece of software that Coursera has developed uh, that we uh, took advantage of. Uh, and so it ran for a month from uh, the month of August. And uh, by the end of the month, uh, we had 175,000 people signed up. Uh, unbelievable. And, and in fact, it was so popular that they left it open for another week, and it almost got up to 200,000. Now, it turns out that that's not the record. The record is something like 330,000 for some of these computer science you know, machine learning courses. But uh, it turns out that what was different from ours uh, from the others is the fact that there are more people who kept on. Typically, what happens is that you decay down from you know 100,000 down to you know 10,000. So uh, it, what happened with our courses? Instead of going down, it went up, and that was because of word of mouth. You know, people loved it. It was it was really it was very uh, engaging. We're going to run it again in October, and if anybody's interested, uh, you can just click on to the session, you just uh, Google learning how to learn, and you'll, you'll get right in. It's a top hit. And what's the concept? Here's the concept. The concept is that as we learn more about the brain, we should be able to help you get over all the problems that students have with uh, not, under, you know, not being able to get the concept, uh, procrastination, right? It turns out a lot of the problems are self-generated, right? You, you put off something that you don't like to do. Well, there are, it turns out there are ways of getting around that. There are also ways of increasing and improving your ability to get through these barriers and solve difficult problems. And, and, and uh, these are the things that we go into in the course, right? Just to tell the students what it's like. You know, you've got a brain. We, there's no instruction manual, but here are some hints. Here's the ways that you could improve your learning abilities. And this is going to apply not just to school. It'll apply to anything that you want to learn. Uh, okay, so l let me give you a little taste of what the course was like. I'm going to first play for you uh, on, on the, that website uh, an intro. And the idea is to give the students a flavor. Because what happens is that uh, people basically, uh, they go through, there are hundreds of courses that you could take, and they just click through them and look for something really interesting. So you, you've got to put up a little teaser for them, right, to draw them in, to get them interested. And so I will give you a little bit of background that we designed the course primarily aimed at high school students and at college students. And uh, I don't know if you've been in high school recently, but it turns out zombies are really big. <laughs> so it's one of the themes in the course is, you know, we, we, we talk about zombies as a, as a kind of a foil to uh, uh, the teaching and, uh, you know, using your brain. Okay, let's see if this works. So here's Barbara. What do you do when you just can't figure something out? For zombies, it's pretty simple. They can just keep bashing their brains against the wall. But living brains are a lot more complex. Turns out, though, that if you understand just a little bit of some of the basics about how your brain works, you can learn more easily and be less frustrated. That's what this course is all about. We'll learn about important concepts like neural resting states, Although you can picture these as a brain in a hammock, they're actually great tools to help you figure out new concepts and ideas. In this course, you'll learn practical ideas and approaches for learning, often using fun metaphors and analogies. You'll learn about things like how sleep helps the brain wash away toxins, allowing you to think more clearly for tests. You'll learn about why you procrastinate and what you can do to tackle it. Together with my co-instructor, Dr. Terence Sinowski, the Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute and one of the world's leading neuroscientists, we'll explore not only what research is telling us about learning, but how you can use this That's research in your here. everyday life to help you learn better and live better. I'm Barbara Oakley. Okay, so that uh, gave you a little of a taste of you know uh, the things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about um, in the course. Uh, different modes that the brain is in, um, and, and, and Barbara alluded to something called the resting state. So let me tell you this story. This is really a fascinating story. It tells you something about how neuroscientists themselves can get caught up 
in, in a, uh, a dead end and, and how you get, jump out of that. Hello? <laughs> okay. So uh, brain imaging. So brain imaging is, is very popular. You see it in the newspapers all the time now and the beautiful pictures of things that are activated and, uh, you know, uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, visual system in the back, uh, motor system. And the traditional way of doing experiments like this, and, and, and not just with humans, but also with monkeys, is that you present a stimulus, and then you uh, have a, 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 a task. You have to be able to discriminate, uh, categorize, or maybe you just have to uh, learn a motor response, uh, press a button. And you're, you're doing that constantly, and uh, the resolution isn't very good, so you have to average over many seconds. And, and so you get this beautiful picture. Uh, however, the tradition was that, look, you know, there's this background we've got to subtract. So what you do is you put the person, before you start the task, you just have them sit there and you tell them, just, you know, just rest and, you know, just take it easy. We're just going to calibrate things. But what you're doing is you're taking the, the resting state of the brain, what it's doing in, when it's not doing anything else, and you subtract that from the task. And the idea is you get rid of everything that is not relevant to the task. And, and that was the way that all the experiments were done. But about uh, 10 years ago, Mark Rakel, Wash U, asked the question, well, what are we subtracting? You know, there, there's got to be something going on in the brain. I mean, the brain's never at rest, right? So what is it? So it turns out that uh, when the brain is at rest, and that's, this is uh, what the brain looks like when it's at rest, uh, it turns out that there are areas that become active, and in particular, uh, the parietal cortex and the frontal cortex that uh, are not only becoming active, as you can see, but they are becoming active together. And that's shown here by the orange and yellow lines going up and down together. And that's because their activity is linked. But the moment that you start interacting with the world, sensory motor interactions, these areas, the activity goes down and instead, you get uh, activity in these blue areas. In fact, they are, they, they are opposite. In other words, when you have sensory motor activity, you have no uh, uh, activity in the so-called default state. But when you are resting and there's no sensory information coming in and you're just thinking, you know, who knows what's going through your head, uh, then these other areas pop up. Isn't that interesting? There's a whole set of areas that are only active when you're not doing something active. And this gave rise to the idea that, you know, there may be a lot of these resting states, and now there's something like 24 that people have identified. So it turns, and, and what's interesting is that each one of these states consists of not just a single area, but typically five or six connected areas that are working together, and their activity is going up and down together. And, and by the way, this blue is from the blue areas. You can see it's anti-correlated. When it goes down, the, uh, the, uh, the, the yellow is up, and vice versa. So this was, this was really interesting, and uh, as it turns out, it, it falls into another uh, it, 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 uh, category of experiments that psychologists have done, which is to show that there's unconscious processing, even when you're not uh, interacting with the world, that helps you solve problems. And, and that was uh, the, what Barbara calls the diffuse state. So the idea is that when you're actively trying to solve a problem, your brain is this, uh, this, this area, this, these areas here, actually, sensory motor areas that are interacting with the material are highly active, but your default state here is, is suppressed. So, how, how, so it turns out the default state is really good at solving problems. So how, how, do, you, how do you activate it? Well, well, it turns out the thing you should do is exactly opposite of what you think you should do. No, you, should, you probably are thinking, well, you should concentrate more, more hard. You should really think, think, think. And it turns out that's exactly the wrong thing to do because you're basically bashing your head against the wall, same wall over and over again. You've got to jump over the barrier. The way you jump over the barrier is by doing something completely different, by just going off and uh, gardening, you know, something that you enjoy doing, but take your mind off the problem. It turns out that the part of your brain that uh, is you know, these, these resting states take over, and they are working on the problem, and, uh, and more often than not, if, if, if you're, you know, uh, wait, you know, it just pops into your head, oh, that's what I was doing wrong. And interestingly, it turns out the, the best time when you can get these 
default states to work is when you're sleeping, of all things. So it's knowing that memory consolidation takes place while you're sleeping. And it turns out you can do creative problem solving when you're sleeping. Again, very counterintuitive, but there's more and more evidence accumulating that that's the way things work. And you know, who would have guessed, right? I mean, it's not something that is obvious uh, you know, uh, intuitively. But it's really true. In fact, I discover I'm reading email, and how am I going to answer this? I have no idea how I'm going to answer this. It's really awkward or difficult. I just, I just walk over to the kitchen, and I you know, get some coffee or something and talk to somebody, and suddenly I know exactly what I should say. So it works. It's remarkable. And I'm sure many of you experience this. I mean, anybody who does creative work knows that they, they, there's an unconscious part of their mind that is at work. And uh, Sarah, last night in her lecture, actually mentioned this, that when you come to the Salk Institute and you're, you're presented with this an amazing vista that you've never seen before, your brain is the unconscious part of your brain that's putting the pieces together, is reacting to it. And, and it, it's really... Uh, how to, how, to, how to take advantage of that. That's really what the course is all about. How to, how to, act, how to actively in, involve and engage those parts of your brain that are really important. Now, another thing that um, we've learned in neuroscience just over the last uh, 10, 15 years is that a lot of the, of the uh, things that you read in textbooks you know, the dogmas turn out to be wrong. And that's something that uh, Francis Crick used to tell me. He said, Terry, that, you know, it, you, you shouldn't try to model all the data in literature because some of it's wrong. And so you have to know what's right. Well, one of the things I learned when I was in school was that when you're born, that you have all the neurons you're ever going to have, and then from then on, it's all downhill, right? That's not true. Rusty Gage discovered that there are parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, where new neurons are born every day. But in fact, um, you know, this part of the brain is very important for learning and memory. So the, 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 you know, this is really an important major discovery. They're also born, interestingly, in the olfactory system. So there are only a few places, but it is, it's not true that, that you have, there's no new neurons. The other thing that, that we were taught is that during the first, uh, you know, during your uh, uh, when the baby's born, there's a period of, of synaptogenesis where connections are formed. And after that matures, that, uh, again, it's kind of like, uh, you know, hardwired and there's, there's, you can only make changes in the synaptic strengths. You can't make new synapses. Well, that turns out to be wrong, too. And it took new techniques to be able to see that. And what you're seeing here is from a recent paper uh, using a technique called two-photon microscopy. And this is a technique that allows us to see the, not just the dendrite, you know, this is a part of a neuron, one little piece of a neuron, but each of these little knobs called spines is a synapse, a connection with another neuron. And not only can we see them, but this is in a living brain, in vivo, uh, and we can image them before training on some new task. This is actually a mouse that's been trained to do some motor task. But we can come back 24 hours later and look at the very same dendrite and, and compare. And it turns out that each one of these arrows here corresponds to a, a new neuron, a new synapse, that was not there before. And what this is telling us is that there are new connections being formed all the time. This is called neuroplasticity. There are some that actually disappear, like this one actually disappears. And what, what that means is that there's turnover. There's, there's, constant refreshment, constant changes. And this is good news, because it means that if you keep your mind active, you can take advantage of this, not just to learn new things, but to be able to uh, enhance your ability to react to novel environments. Francis Crick, uh, I have a tea, a tea room in my lab, and we have tea every day in the afternoon. And Francis Crick, when he, he's a really close colleague, would come to tea every day and talk to us. He loved talking about science. And so we had these wonderful conversations. One day he came in and said, Terry, I gave a talk yesterday at a women's club. And I said, well, you know, what did you talk about? And he said, well, they wanted to know about the brain and DNA. And he said, one of the women asked me a question. She said, of all the things that you've learned about the brain, 
what do you think is the most exciting? And he thought for a second and said, we've discovered that the brain is plastic. And this look of horror came over her face, and she <laughs> fainted straight away. <laughs> but it turns out that you know, she should have, because this is really an important discovery. Now, we've known for a long time that um, when you learn something new, it takes many months and years for it to consolidate. And, and one of the pieces of evidence is that if you have um, injury to the region of the brain around the hippocampus, or actually concussion can do this too, uh, you lose the ability to form new memories, but you also lose about a year's worth of old memories, and that's because you needed that part of the brain, the hippocampus and the region around it, to consolidate the, what you, the new things that you're learning with the old things that are in the brain. You have these 10 to the 14 synapses you've got to tweak. And that, uh, it takes time to do that properly. This is from a movie called Memento. How many people have seen it? So it, it's a very confusing movie until you realize this guy has amnesia, right? This is his problem. And so how does he remember things? Well, he writes things on his body. So, so he can remember who it is that he's chasing, what, why he's doing it, right? And this is really quite dramatic. Uh, and uh, we've learned an enormous amount about that uh, in terms of being able to study that both in humans and in monkeys. And, and, so we're, and we know that sleep is very, very important. Now, just within the last, oh, couple of years, what we've begun to realize is that uh, this process of consolidation uh, is actually, not again, not something that just happens passively, it's, it's active. So here's, here's what happens, okay? Uh, you, you, you have some experience and then uh, it, somehow you go from short-term memory to long-term memory through this process, I'm not going to describe the details, but sometime in the future you, you remember that, that particular experience you've had, that particular person's face, and you reactivate the same circuits, right? Well, what we discovered is that the process of activating your old memory actually changes through reconsolidation. You actually change your old memory. It's not the same as it was before. And that means you're constantly, as, as you go through life, you're constantly changing the narrative of who you are. As you remember things that have happened to you, as new things happen, you're constantly, it's, your brain is not the same brain anymore. It's, the hardware has changed. The synapses are changing. In fact, uh, I like to say that you know, you go, to, you go to sleep at night, you wake up with a different brain. It's, it's, it's a better upgrade than you'll get from Microsoft. <laughs> now, this is the real shocker. This has happened just within the last couple, couple of years, actually. This is, I, I think, uh, going to transform some of the things, again, another dogma that we have. So the, the, <clears throat> there, is, uh, there it turns out, in addition to neurons, you know, these are the ones that get all the publicity. Uh, in the brain, there, it turns out there are just as many astrocytes, and these turn out to be glial cells that are called support cells, and they help maintain uh, the balance of ions in the brain, energy. They, they have connections between the blood vessels and the neurons, and so they were thought to be helper cells. But what we're discovering is that they may actually be doing something much more important. So just a few weeks ago, Steve Heinemann, former colleague, he died just two weeks after the paper came out. And Inder Verma and I published a paper in which we had created a transgenic mouse. So this is a mouse where we've been able to change the genes. And we were able to uh, create a mouse that selectively inactivated the release of neurotransmitters from these astrocytes. It had been known that they released things like small molecules like glutamate and ATP. These are molecules which then are picked up by receptors on the neurons. So they talk to the neurons back and forth. And so the question was, if you could turn off the communication between the astrocytes and the neurons, the blue things here, how would that change behavior? You know, the, 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 with these new tech, you couldn't do that before, but we have these new genetic techniques for knocking out and knocking in genes. Okay, so what we discovered was we, 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 we turned off, we could do this uh, conditionally, we can turn off the release, and we tested on many, many different tasks. They look normal, they seem to be seeing things and behaving normally like normal mice, but it turns out that they had a selective deficit in a particular form of memory, which is called novel object recognition. 
So here's how it works. If, if you take a mouse and uh, have an environment where it uh, is able to uh, run around with a lot of objects, the mouse will, will spend a lot of time sniffing all the objects, and, and after a while it, gets, uh, it, it knows the environment. Now, if the next day you come back and you put a new object in the environment, the mouse makes a beeline for the new object because, you know, it's, it's, what is this? What does it smell like? What, what is, can I eat it? You know, is it good? Is it bad? I mean, is it something I should be concerned about? And it spends a, a majority of its time there, and then eventually it, it adapts, and that's, that's the normal mouse behavior. Well, these mice completely ignore the novel object as if it doesn't exist. And it's not like, you know, it, it spends half the amount of time. It spends no time compared to a uh, normal mouse. So this is really amazing. Here's a form of behavior, right? Novelty detection, which uh, it, no one had any clue that the astrocytes had anything to do with this. Now, so what is it? Maybe it's screwing up the electrical activity. So we did very, very careful experiments, and as far as we could tell, the neurons are normal. They have the same action potentials. The synapses work exactly the same way that they do in normal mice. Uh, the only difference that we saw was that in the EEG, there was a deficit in the amount of power in a particular frequency band called the gamma band, between 30 and 80 hertz. And it's known from many experiments in humans and others that this is an important frequency band that's important for cognitive activity. When you're paying attention, power goes up in this part of the band. Uh, when you're uh, expecting something, power goes up. And the fact that power went down in these mice suggests that the astrocytes may be selectively interacting with the circuits in the brain that are very important for your higher brain function. So this is, you know, something we would never have predicted. But that's what science is all about. It's not what you expect, it's what you, what you see. So there, uh, there's lots of uh, new things to learn. So I, what I want to do now is uh, play one more clip from the, uh, uh, from the MOOC, and this is in the last week. And I'm going to do something here. That sound wasn't quite what I was expecting in the last clip. Okay, so let's play it. And, and this, the idea here is now we're, we've gone through uh, a lot of material that the students are absorbing, like this idea of a diff, the unconscious versus the conscious processing. And you know, we're giving them uh, information from the brain. We're giving them information about uh, you know, uh, what happens when you sleep. And, and now the question, you know, what are, what are, what are, what are good uh, practices that you should, uh, we, we should know about in order to be able to be a good learner? Welcome back to Learning How to Learn. Today we're going to talk about how to become a better learner. As we learn more about the brain, we can become better learners and here are two tips for how to learn better. Tip number one, the best gift that you can give your brain is physical exercise. We once thought that all of the neurons in your brain were already present at birth, but we now know that in a few places, new neurons are born every day. One of these places is in your hippocampus, a brain area that is very important for learning new things that we already discussed earlier in the course. In this experiment, a rat is shown learning how to distinguish a picture of a flower from a picture of an airplane. In the background is a photo of neurons in the hippocampus with the old neurons, shown in blue, and newly generated neurons in red. As the rat learns the task, these new neurons are recruited to help perform better pattern separation between the two pictures. These new neurons help you learn new things, but they will die if you don't use them. New experiences will rescue them. Exercise, interestingly, also helps new neurons survive. Exercise is by far more effective than any drug on the market today to help you learn better. It benefits all of your vital organisms, not just your brain. It is unfortunate that schools are dropping gym and recess to make room for more instruction. Gym and recess are by far the most important parts of the curriculum. Here's another tip, and this has to do with practice making perfect, but only when your brain is prepared. There are certain critical periods in the development of your brain when sudden improvements occur in specific abilities. Expect them to happen and prepare your brain for them. 
The critical period for first language acquisition extends up to puberty. And after that, it is much more difficult to acquire a second language and nearly impossible to achieve a native accent. Barbara learned Russian One of the best adult, studied critical periods in the brain is when binocular depth perception or stereopsis matures during the first two years of life. Stereopsis is the magic behind magic eye pictures like the one shown here. If you stare at this image and slightly cross your eyes, you will see staircases pop out of the page. There is a slight shift between the images in the two eyes and your brain interprets the slight shift as a difference in depth. Not everyone, however, can see this. Over 5% of the population is stereo blind. If the two eyes are not properly aligned during the first two years of development, the neurons in your visual cortex will fail to properly strengthen the inputs from the two eyes and depth perception is permanently impaired. Well, that's the dogma. But Sue Berry, a friend of mine from graduate school at Princeton, was able to recover stereo vision through eye exercises and wrote a book about it entitled Fixing My Gaze, A Scientist's Journey into Seeing in Three Dimensions. Practice can repair as well as train the brain, but this takes much longer past the critical period. This brings us to zombies. Zombies can't learn. It is also clear from their behavior that they have brain damage, especially in the front of their cortex, which is the part that makes plans, as well as in their language areas. Learning, planning, language, these are the skills that make us human. The prefrontal cortex is also involved in complex analysis, in social behaviors, as well as decision making and planning. It is the last part of the cortex to mature. So until this happens, there may be a little bit of zombie in you. <laughs> and, and by the way, it's, it's really true that uh, part of the reason why teenagers are so crazy is because their prefrontal cortex isn't completely online yet. <laughs> uh, last to get myelinated, the last to really mature. Okay, so here are some statistics. And, and I have to say that I, was, I, I just wasn't prepared for what was going to happen, you know, giving this course. It was just a, a tumultuous experience for that one month. I mean, it was like, you know, everything topsy-turvy. So here, uh, by the end of the first four weeks, uh, we had 176,000 uh, people who had uh, joined. And that means they, they saw at least one of the lectures. There were about 50 lectures, uh, each lasting five to ten minutes. Uh, they, they come from 206 different countries. This is fantastic. I didn't even know there were that many countries. Right? <laughs> uh, and, and as you can see, the, the, the enrollment here uh, it, it really it, it just kept climbing and climbing. Now, the, um, here are the top continents, all the continents, and the, the top countries, as you can see, they tend to be the English speakers, but there, it turns out that uh, there were, uh, it just extends all the way down. Uh, th and 3% of, you know, a, f a few percent of, of, of 100,000 is still quite a few people. <clears throat> now, here's, here's the, 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 the part that I really uh, wasn't prepared for. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's look here at the demographics. Um, so it turns out that this is the age brackets, and the, these are the females on top and the males in the bottom. And, <clears throat> and in, in all Coursera courses, uh, about 60% of the uh, learners uh, uh, turn out to be male, and that was true for our course too. But here's the, the part that uh, really surprised me, which is that only 3% were below the age of 19. So who were the people who were taking the course? Well, they turned out to be uh, distributed throughout the, all the way up to 70. So it turned out that our biggest audience turned out to be professionals who were interested in acquiring new skills, who wanted to get a new job, and they needed to be able to learn new things. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 you know, uh, so, you know, we had, we had, we had, we had uh, designed the course for high school students. And so, what's going on here? How, how is it that the course is so popular? Well, it turns out that we got an amazing deluge of letters, email, from people who had taken the course who said that it transformed their life. They only had known this when they were going to school. It would be so much better. Because, you know, they've been actually using this in their everyday life. And, and you know, this is, these are people who are actively engaged in the world. Uh, so here's <clears throat> one letter from somebody, uh, uh, <clears throat> actually don't know where she's from, 
Uh, but they were from all over the world. And she's an MBA. And, and she, she's telling us that she, it's very sad that uh, the course is over because of the fact that uh, she's you know, gotten a lot out of it. <clears throat> I've already requested my daughter to enroll. My son is already using some of the techniques. And, and she's sending a note to all her MBA classmates <laughs> to uh, be able to learn. So this is, I think, uh, telling us that this is actually, you know, there's, there's a niche here. There, there was a need. And we would, I, you know, I would, I have, you know, over the years I teach at UCSD, I probably have taught, you know, maybe, I don't know, l less than a thousand students, right? And suddenly, in one month, I have suddenly reached throughout the whole world, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands. And, you know, this is, this is transforming in terms of what I can do, the influence I can have on the world. So the last thing I want to tell you about is another transformative event that took place on April 2nd, 2013. So I was in the White House when President Obama made the announcement that our nation was going to commit itself over the next 10 years to a grand challenge called the Brain Initiative. And how many people here have heard about it? Well, you know, I was, I was uh, talking to Gordon Chong, and he said, you can't not hear about it. It's in all the newspapers. People are talking about it. And, and uh, that wasn't always the case. It was, you know, for a long time when, you know, I told people I was working on neuroscience, their eyes were glazed over, not quite sure what I was doing with their brains, but uh, <clears throat> the key here is, um, this is an acronym, uh, Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. So here's, here's the concept. The concept is that the way that you make discoveries is by creating new instruments, techniques, that allow you to make progress faster. And we need to bring engineers to work with neuroscientists so that the engineers can build things that we need. And, and up till now, you know, every lab has its own tools and techniques. And you know, they have to create their own. They're not engineers. But somehow, that you have to do the best you can. But if we can actually encourage these interactions, these, these uh, collaborations, then progress will be accelerated. And we desperately need to accelerate progress in understanding the brain because we have more and more of our population aging and Alzheimer's and many other cognitive deficits happen as you grow older. Memory loss, uh, you know, the, 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 it really uh, is going is to affect more and more and, and very, very costly both in terms of the healthcare system but also on care providers, on families. It's an incredibly difficult problem that we are facing. And it's not just Alzheimer's, it's depression, it's uh, bipolar disease, it's autism. These are schizophrenia, these are uh, devastating diseases that affect a very, very large number of people. And, and we need to make progress. And, that, and that's really what the president was telling us. <clears throat> this photograph was taken just 10 minutes before the announcement. And uh, the uh, group assembled here are kind of the people who have been tasked to really lead the project. Francis Collins, director of NIH, is the lead organization. Uh, he asked uh, Bill Newsom and me and 13 others, or 15 on the committee, to advise the NIH on the areas uh, that the Brain Initiative should be focusing on, the goals, the milestones, and w what is the highest priority. Uh, in addition to the uh, NIH, the uh, National Science Foundation, and also uh, uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Administration, the military arm of the research. These are the Darth Vader's of research. <laughs> Although uh, Artie here is obviously not a Darth Vader. Um, and Amy Gutman, who is the uh, chairman of the uh, Bioethics Committee, uh, was brought in, because this is going to be very important. We're going to be dealing with human brains, so we have to be very careful. Uh, but there are also uh, several private institutions that are contributing. Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, this is Jerry Rubin, who runs uh, Genelia Farm. He basically has a brain initiative for fly brains. And that's because he works on flies. Uh, Alan Jones from the uh, Allen Institute for Brain Science, uh, they're going to be uh, developing a brain initiative for mice. So mice have uh, very nice visual systems. We're going to try to understand their visual system. So. <clears throat> Our uh, committee of 15 spent one year, I have to say, I, I, it really wiped one year of my life you know, off, off, the, off, off the chart because we spent uh, more time on this committee you know, working together with each other 
than I have spent on any committee. We met physically four times in four parts of the United States on different uh, aspects of the brain initiative, molecular approaches, uh, recording techniques, human neuroscience, what can we do for uh, helping people uh, you know, that are uh, being operated on for brain surgery. And then finally, uh, theory, computation, and big data. And what do we do with all the data we're collecting? It becomes very much more difficult to analyze the data. And as you'll see, uh, we're, we're developing tools for doing that too. But in addition, we had endless uh, conference calls and three additional in-person meetings. So this is seven you know, three-day meetings. Uh, and I learned an enormous amount about neuroscience. I mean, because you know, if people were telling us about their 50 people that we actually uh, interviewed here. And, and, and you know, about areas <clears throat> they knew very little about when I first started, molecular areas, for example. Tremendous. I learned a tremendous amount, but I also learned a tremendous amount about my colleagues on the committee, because we disagreed about a lot of things. And so, you know, when you're really uh, come right down to it, you know, why do you believe that? <clears throat> and, and you really have to uh, come to a, a consensus, and we did. And our report, <clears throat> which was released this last June, uh, laid out 140 pages of a kind of roadmap for what we hope will happen over the next uh, 12 years. The idea being that w the first two years are just run up but we hope that by uh, the, uh, the end of 2025, we will have accelerated research by a factor of 10, so we could do 100 years in 10 years. Uh, it's gonna cost. The budget will ramp up to 500 million a year. Uh, the first year, the uh, first uh, round of, of grants are gonna be announced on October 1st. The, <clears throat> that was about 40 million worth of grants, 50 grants are gonna be announced. Um, the second, uh, the RFAs are coming out for the second year, and there's going to be 100 million for the second year, and that will ramp up to 500 million a year. So the idea is that by, uh, you know, by the end of the fifth year, this is going to be a really uh, major effort that is going to involve many, many different uh, labs and groups of people from outside of neuroscience. We're bringing in all these new, t fresh talent, absolutely essential, if we're going to solve a problem as difficult as understanding the brain. Here's uh, the bottom line. The bottom line is that it's all about scaling up. So traditionally, neuroscientists have recorded from one neuron at a time. Well, there are 100 billion neurons in the human brain. And if you did that one at a time, you know, that would take hundreds and hundreds of years. But now there are tools and techniques that allow us to record with, with using these genetic techniques to record from literally hundreds and thousands of neurons at the same time. But this is like the Chinese curse. You know, may you get what you wish for. <laughs> Because now, how do you handle? Because you know, when, it, when you did it one at a time, you could graph each one of them. But when there's a thousand, you know, your graduate students is, is, it doesn't have that much time. So you have to come up with new tools and techniques that are going to allow us to do that analysis in this very high dimensional space. So, so <clears throat> and it turns out we've got to do that not just for uh, recording. We've got to do that for anatomy. We've got to do a complete reconstruction of all of these connections, uh, create the network of, in the brain. That's called connectomics. Here's something that really shocked me. Uh, so, you know, we know how many different types of neurons there are in the liver. There's four different types of neurons. We don't know how many different types of, 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 of cells in the liver. But there, we don't know how many different types of cells there are in the brain. We, we, we think there are about 100 in the retina. And we can only guess that there's between 100 and 1,000 in the cortex. But we can't identify them. We can't selectively record from them. We can't selectively manipulate them. So one of the big goals of the project is to be able to come genetically uh, mark every single cell type so that we can manipulate them individually. Behavior turns out to be incredibly important. Nothing in neuroscience makes any sense except in the light of behavior, because that's the ultimate readout. The problem is that behavior is very complex. And in the past, I told you the way you did an experiment was by having strapping down the human or the monkey and having them do some reflexive action. And we've learned a lot about that. But you know, that's not the way that we behave in the real world. We behave in the real world by making decisions and deciding whether, what you're going to do next or deciding, you know, how am I going to handle this problem? You know, you, you're very much more proactive. <clears throat> we need to find out what's going on in your brain when you're doing that. <clears throat> and that's going to require scaling up our analysis of behavior so that we can understand what's going on <clears throat> uh, from the outside. I'll give you one example. 
uh, I have uh, one of my students, uh, former grad students, has developed a computer program that allows her to detect every single muscle in your face. It's called facial action coding by Paul Ekman. And automatically uh, detect what emotions you are having at that moment. She started a company called Emotions, and now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's having a huge impact uh, in terms of applications to medicine, applications to uh, commerce. Uh, you know, the focus groups ask people to, uh, to write down on a questionnaire, did you like the product? Well, people will tell you anything, you know. They, they, they want to tell you what they, you, what they think you want to know. But I'll tell you, if you look at someone's face when they're eating their product, you can tell pretty much what their brain is saying. <laughs> okay, so, this, so it's all about scaling up. And I want to give you a taste of that, so uh, I hope this works. This is a zebrafish, and the idea is that with these new modern techniques for labeling neurons, uh, we can actually detect activity in 80% of the 100,000 neurons in the zebrafish brain. This is the forebrain, and, and each of these little dots is a single neuron. And you're going to see the, 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 the neurons as they're actually being activated uh, in, in the course of this uh, recording. I guess it's not going to work. Yeah, I had trouble earlier. OK, so, uh, so I won't play it for you then, uh, but I'll just tell you that uh, when you begin to see how much activity there is, even in a zebrafish that's not swimming, just immobile, you begin to appreciate the resting state, how complex that is. And if you think about it, how could it be that we were ignoring the very thing that we, as human beings, do all the time, which is think? And zebrafish think, too. Who knows what they think about? OK, so so we have all the data. OK, what, what are you going to do with it? Uh, and I've already uh, given away the punchline, machine learning. So it turns out that the work that we did back in the 80s has matured. Computers now are literally a million times faster. And now, instead of building small networks with you know, 300 units, we can create networks with thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of, of model neurons with literally uh, you know, 12 layers deep, just like the cortex. It has a hierarchy of cortical areas in the visual system. Well, we can create these networks now. We could train them up. And uh, this particular group, Neural Information Processing Systems, uh, which uh, is uh, run out of my lab, and last year in Lake Tahoe uh, was attended by 2,000 researchers and all the major companies, uh, information technology, Google, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, they were all there. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg was there personally. I talked to him at the deep learning uh, workshop that we had. Uh, and and uh, they're very interested because they see this as a technology that they're going to use for being able to extract from their huge databases, from people, you. How many people here have Facebook accounts? OK. You have just given away your personal life history to Facebook, and they are going to mine it. They're going to create a theory of mind of every single person in Facebook. They're going to know you better than you know yourself. Scary. So here is an example. Um, so it used to be the case that you know if you if you trained up a network you can discriminate you know maybe you know 44 100 different categories but what about images there are hundreds of thousands of different types of categories of images right and so this was a network that was designed to take in 10 million uh, images from YouTube and the idea was through all these layers uh, th through feed forward connections to be able to train the network so that it's able to extract information from just random pictures that were taken from YouTube. Now, here's what they discovered. Um, and, and by the way, this, this won a prize of something called, it was a competition called ImageNet. And they were able to achieve with 10,000 image categories, I think like something like you know, 6% uh, on the first hit and like 30% on the second hit, you know, on the, on the, uh, the uh, best guess. OK. so. Here's the input, that's the image. Uh, and here's the very top, representing the highest uh, level concepts. 
So if you look at the properties of a single neuron at an early stage, and you do the same thing that neurophysiologists do, basically you, you ask what in the image did this neuron respond to? And it turns out that it's just like neurons in the primary visual cortex, it responds to oriented edges. And that was, it was never told that, it just extracted that. It figured this out on its own, right? That's what learning is all about. But if you look higher in the intermediate layers, you discover that there are nodes here that selectively respond to particular faces. Why is that? Well, it turns out YouTube's loaded with faces. Interestingly, if you record from particular parts of the monkey brain, and Tom has done that, it turns out that there are selective units in the monkey brain, in our brains, that selectively are activated by faces. But there was something that they discovered which was completely unexpected, which was that the, by far the most dominant uh, uh, feature that neurons at the highest level responded to were not human faces, but cat faces. <laughs> but you know, I, Tom, has anybody ever looked at cat faces in humans? No, okay. So I mean, who knows? I mean, we see a lot of cat faces too on YouTube, but you know, it's, it's possible that the humans also have these cat neurons. Okay, so let me end with uh, the following uh, big picture of, of what I think is going on. And this has to do with culture and society, uh, uh, what we do as humans in, in large groups. So back in 1961, the United States was in dire uh, naval, uh, you know, looking behavior because the Russians had launched a satellite in 1957. The first satellite that circled the Earth that was you know, able to pass over continents and uh, listen. And, uh, and the question was, we thought we were the technology uh, leaders. Why is it that we weren't the first? And you know, we had fallen behind. And so, in 1961, John F. Kennedy created a grand challenge. He challenged the country to put together a team that would send a man to the moon. Now, at, in 61, nobody knew how to do it. Nobody knew how to build a rocket big enough. Nobody had the materials that were going to bring uh, the, 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 you know, the capsule back through the atmosphere, because it's uh, extremely hot as you come through the atmosphere. No, the electronics didn't exist to be able to do the, all the calculations and so forth, because it was you know, very primitive back in the, in the 60s. But we did it, okay? In 1969, Neil Armstrong was the first man to step foot on the moon. So here's an interesting factoid. The average age of an engineer at NASA in 1969 was 26. Eight years earlier, they were in school. They were just making decisions about their life. What am I going to do? And they were inspired by this goal that, we, that John F. Kennedy set, that we were going to go to the moon, and they wanted to be part of that. And so they went into engineering school. Education, I was in high school at the time, and education was completely renovated uh, in terms of the, the, the textbooks that were available for high school science, both biology as well as physics. And uh, it was a lot of, uh, of, of, of really uh, a shift that went on in the society. Okay, and it had a, a, an interesting impact. Okay, now everybody thinks that, it was, that, that the, the goal of John F. Kennedy was to go to the moon. It wasn't. It wasn't. And I can prove it. Have we been to the moon since then? No. Why? Well, there's nothing of interest there for us. Maybe some scientific, uh, you know, the moon rocks might be of interest, but you know, uh, you know, there's, 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 it's, it's not an economic uh, activity. You're doing that for other purposes, right? But what did we buy? It was a, a huge program, right? What we bought was a tremendous advance in engineering technology. Electronics blossomed, you know, Integrated circuits created the modern age that we're living in. And rocket science, it created a whole industry, satellites, weather satellites, communication satellites. That's a huge multi-billion dollar industry. 
that wouldn't have, and, and there were leaders in it. And, and we, if we didn't make the investment back then, we wouldn't be the leaders, right? So this is really what was being done. It was making an investment in the future of the United States. And that is what the Brain Initiative is all about. It's making an investment in understanding the brain now so that we could help, we could become world leaders in being able to help humans who have mental disorders, neurological disorders, in the future. And, uh, and it, it, it really is, is it not just going to affect a few neuroscientists, it's changing, it will change education. It will change maybe architecture. It will change how we look at the world. It will change how we look at ourselves. It will change how we think about politics. It'll, it's going to change everything. This is, gonna, this, is, this is a grand challenge, maybe the grandest of all challenges, is to understand ourselves. So the, uh, take you back to the White House. So this picture was taken uh, just before the photo op that you saw at the beginning. And I happened to be talking to some colleagues. And uh, suddenly, I got tapped on my shoulder. And I turned around, and there, oh, looming over me, was the president. And you know, I was so tongue-tied, I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> and the only thing I could say is, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you. I, we're a little behind schedule, but that was so inspiring. I think we should take a couple minutes for questions for Terry, if there are any that, that pop up. Eduardo. Do you think that the reason we recognize cats so well is evolutionarily we were scared to death of cats, lions? Maybe it's a well, remainder of that experience. Uh, so. My wife is very fond of cats, for reasons I cannot explain. <laughs> but I don't think it's because uh, of the, the evolutionary history. Now, she is afraid of snakes and spiders. Okay? So there you've got a case. But no, I, th I think that uh, we, we created the, uh, pets that uh, we interact with. And, and they have different minds. We know that. Pet, pet owners know that. They, they have cat minds and they have dog minds. And uh, they, they evolve in a different niche for a different purpose. And, you know, it's, it's interesting when your cat comes up to you and drops a mouse by your feet, you know. It's, <laughs> it's telling you something about what, what they're thinking. I, I think we, we like them because they're cute. Well, why do we think they're cute? The same reason we like babies. They're cute. <laughs> Another question. Hi, yeah, I just had a quick question in the ups and downs of the economy. I've done over the years a lot of different things, including a lot of private one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And my question was about learning and the role of curiosity. And, you know, are, is there a natural curiosity? Some people seem to be more interested in things. You had spoken about novelty detection. Is that the same thing as curiosity? Could you still speak on I'm that? I'm curious to know where you are. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. It's really interesting when you don't know where someone is. It's really just unsettling because you know, <laughs> what are the, what are, and the reason is you, you you know you get a lot of information from someone's face, you know what what they're expressing at the time because that that punctuates and it it it, it adds a, a, a if something very important flavor it adds flavor to the words. Okay, so curiosity, uh, you know, curiosity killed the cat, <laughs> but it turns out interestingly that play. You know, exploration is something that is very basic for the brain. And you can see it not just uh, in humans, you know, little kids playing, but you see it actually in uh, many, many different animal species. You know, the dogs go through a phase when they're pups where they, 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 they practice, uh, you know, attacking each other. But it's, it's playful attacking. You know, they're getting their, their chops to be able to, when they get older, to, so they could do it for, for good. You know, when they need to defend themselves or territorial and so forth. But, uh, but the, 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 the brain basically is an information-seeking device. Absolutely essential that you know your environment. And, and you will go and, you know, as, as Sarah said yesterday, uh, you know, you're, you're drawn to that river of life. Why is that? Why is it that you, you, you what is this? You, 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 it's a little bit different from what you've seen before, and you want to see, what, well, how big is it? 
Why is it there? You ask these questions in your mind, and, and this is something, this is the way that we learn about the world. We learn about the world through seeking out and understanding uh, what's out there so that someday you may need to have that knowledge to be able to survive. Let's take one more question. I have two children and they're constantly playing games and seeking more games. Can you, in, in this age of handheld devices and constant engagement, or more engagement than prior ages, is there a difference? Is, is there something we're... So that, there's a debate, it, as, as, you know, there's a big debate going on right now um, in the national academies about the influence that uh, that the, the mobile handheld devices are having on society, not just on children. And we had a uh, meeting. Uh, this is the National Academy Kavli's Initiative uh, uh, series of meetings, one, but one specifically uh, on in innovation and the effect that it's having on society. And uh, it was, again, eye-opening in the sense that it, it's, uh, there are kids out there that are multitasking. It's not just their one handheld device, they'll typically have like six things going on at once. They're doing their email at the same time that they're doing their Facebook at the same time they're doing their texting at the same time. You know, and, and what it's, it's telling us is that apparently that's what the brain is, is, is naturally able to do and it's doing it. So the, the, how was it, but, and as I said earlier, every experience you have changes the hardware. Their, your kids' brains are not the same as the ones that you have because you didn't grow up with that, or maybe you did, I don't know, you're kind of young. <laughs> no, and, and you know, it, 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 but every, every single generation has said that about the previous generation, right? That, you know, the, 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 you know these new textbooks are gonna change, you know, how other kids are thinking about the farm, right? Yeah, well, that's what happens, you know. When, you know, you leave the farm, you don't go back. So your kids are leaving the farm. <laughs> the, Terry, the artist, Grant Wood, painted American Gothic, once said that the best ideas he ever got came to him while he was milking the cows. That, that's exactly what, what the brain is telling us, is that uh, we're, we're, we're part of the world, we're biological animals, and uh, we heard that yesterday in the keynote address, and we're gonna discover why that's the case. We're gonna discover neuroscience in our generation is gonna figure it out. I think that's a good point to end. Uh, again, we're a little, and thank you again, Terry.